Last year I took a Y chromosome test with Ancestry.com. Turns out I come from a long line of J2As who streamed out of Anatolia, modern day Turkey. We've been very busy the last 20,000 years. One of the treasures we've given the world is the Festus disk. It's the first document it ever created with movable type, millennia ahead of the Chinese. Originally I was going to do a video on my race, but that got sprawling and out of control. I'm still going to do it, but I focused instead on the Festus disk. Well, that got sprawling and out of control, but here it is, part one, where I deal with who we are and where we came from and what we did after we created the disk. Part two, I cover Linear A, that's the written language of the Minoans that's on the disk. Part three, I cover the disk itself to the best of my ability. And in part four, I sum everything up. So let's get started. We get a lot of really exciting ground to cover. I will begin with the disk. I'll let it speak for itself without commentary which, on its own, was impossible just two years ago. Ique paieriu etuque auditi aopi Ique noa tu sa wa ditique wa hino Ique deriu ne curiate Ique sidate ye si tuti Ique ranaka retue Iwadwa zunario, yoye, ikwe curia. Ikwe wawa teraiswi, sana, ikwe curia. Iwadwa zunario, yoye, ikwe curia. Ikwe watarariu wa, deriu hida, curia que. Ikwe paye, nadate, zuuka. Ikwe wawa teraiswi, paye. Zuka. Ikwe zo tuti, waditi te, irai napu, zo dwawa, sa eneque, zenariutia, payadesa, soti payerio. So rai hi dwa, tia tute, iriani tu, wadwakaye. Au e enete, zetariu, au saye, theterarisa. I pewaye, au nitino, au nopa, au diti, zo au nitino. Wapinadwa, tiriute, ti diti, tinariue, zo au nitino. Pequi radiuti, i the tenati, au pinadwa. DT. This site really put some wind in my sails. What these men did is draw up a big list of cognates of all the different Indo-European languages and fire up a program that treated them like they were snippets of DNA code in a virus. Cognates are words related languages share with each other. Linguists can't do their work without them. But you have to be sure to separate words that are cognates from words that are borrowed. What's the difference? Borrowed words are imported from foreign languages. Cognates are inherited. English is full of borrowed French words. French is full of Latin cognates. All the cognates, not just the words we like, like horse and wheel. Here's the whole team. You should look them up. They're hardcore. This is a map they drew up showing how the Indo-European language spread out of Anatolia, the western half of modern-day Turkey. Note the date of when their algorithm says the language started pushing out into the world. It's going to pop up very soon. As far as the actual spoken Minoan goes, I'm relying on the work of Gareth Owens and John Coleman. Here's Owens standing behind the displayed disc. Owens has even put out an app on the internet where you can listen to the disc. Owens and Coleman worked very hard for six years putting sounds to symbols after an accusation was raised that the Festus disc was a fraud. I read that paper. I found at least two inexcusable factual errors. I hope that guy kept his day job. I also frequented the Minoan language blog of Andres Zeke. I've brought some of his ideas into this video. Now there's quite a bit of Linear A out there beyond the Festus disk, and for that I visited Jan Younger's website at least a dozen times a day to compare and contrast. You'll see a lot of his work here. Here's a sample of his webpage with the Minoan libation formula. Other than the Festus disk, this is the only thing we have that resembles literature coming out of Minoan Crete. Finally, you'll hear me refer to the Gorilla Text. 
This is not a misspelling. It's Goddard and Olivier's Recu des Inscriptions en Linear A, Louis Goddard and Jean-Pierre Olivier. It's from the French School of Athens. This is a gold mine of first-hand photos and drawings of the original Minoan texts. The book is out of print, but you can find it free online. FYI, a full Minoan altar with its inscriptions has been recovered just within the past year. We don't know what it says yet. Can't wait until they publish. Cretans originally passed through the Dodecanese Islands and the Cyclades from southeastern Anatolia. They might have lived in all three of the long-standing regions of Sicilia, the Taurus Mountains, and the Kanya Plain. Although all three are distinctly separate from each other archaeologically, there was no doubt plenty of low-level contact among them. Kanya is the modern name of the city called Iconia in the New Testament. My own ancestors probably came from Cattle Hayuk, or one of the associated towns in the Kanya Plain. For at least a thousand years, these were the largest settlements in the whole world. We migrated out of Anatolia and into Crete in at least two waves, separated by about 3,000 years. The first was in roughly 6500 BC, exactly when the computer model says the Indo-European language started to break up. Before then, Crete had intermittent visitors who apparently rarely stayed. No large-scale settlements. It's also the time archaeologists have noted that advanced Neolithic farmers in Anatolia started spreading out of central Anatolia. Once in Crete, these early settlers were among the first men in the whole world to use a drought animal to pull a plow across a field, if not the first. Many of them bore the Y chromosome marked as J2A M67. For everyone who insists we needed raiders from the steppes of Russia to tell us how a chariot worked, I'd like to point out this would be the record of yoking an animal to a tool and dragging a human being behind it. There was another migration about 3200 BC. Many of these men bore the Y chromosome J2A M92, which is a subplate of M67. These were my ancestors. We can clearly see the evidence of both migrations in the Cretan archaeological record. Foremost is the fact that our entry into Crete was lawful, gradual, and as far as we can tell, nonviolent. Our arrival ended the Stone Age in Crete and started the Bronze Age and civilization. So we came bearing gifts. Together with the original inhabitants and our fellow travelers, we'd be the first people in the world to build aqueducts, just as we'd be the first people in the world to use movable type, with which we created the Festus Disc, almost 3,000 years before the Chinese. We continued to spread throughout the Aegean, and sometime about 2200 BC, we even started moving into Palestine as we were apparently among the first to recover from some kind of catastrophe that had hit the Middle East and Greece. Whatever it was, maybe an out-of-control drought, it seems to have affected the eastern end of Crete. There it decimated at least one settlement. But central and western Crete remained untouched. When Abraham migrated to Palestine with his wife Sarah about 2000 BC, he found us there waiting for him. About 300 years after Abraham and Sarah, we even started migrating to Italy. Our first settlements were in the Aeolian Islands, just northeast of Sicily, and on Vivara, in the Bay of Naples. You might find mention of Mycenaean colonies in Italy, but I know these are Cretans, because their pottery is made from material from the island of Kithra, off the south coast of Greece. Kithra was one of our bigger colonies. Later, we would build more formidable Italian colonies in southern Italy, on the island of Sardinia, and then, almost certainly, later on in central Italy, where I think we built the first wall on the Capitoline Hill on the side of what we would later call Rome, sometime after 1300 BC. The timing is surely perfect. Also during that time, pottery from Italy was exported to Crete. And as far as we know, only to Crete, strengthening the case that it was us, and not mainland Greeks, who were building these colonies. We started our Italian migrations about the same time we made the Festus Disc, maybe a little before. We also made our way up through eastern Italy. Along the coast northeast of Rome, we would eventually be known as the Picente, who were ethnically related to the Latins, obviously. Julius Caesar's former partner Pon Pompey was Picente. During the heyday of the Minoan civilization, which created this disc, we concentrated our efforts on Miletus back in Anatolia, the silver mines of Laurium near Athens, and Kythra in southern Greece near modern-day Sparta. The two groups most famous among the Greeks for their martial vigor were the Spartans, of course, and the Cretans. 
Sparta got her world-renowned constitution from Crete. Even better, Cretans had a tradition of mar martial valor that was far more enduring than Sparta's. They were the best archers in the world for more than 2,000 years. You see the elves in Lord of the Rings? That would be the Cretans. Since Miletus would later be the birthplace of Greek philosophy, you could see that before the Greek collapse of Bronze Age collapse of 1250 BC, we set Greece up nicely for the Classical Age, don't you think? And if I'm right about the Festus disc, the roots of Greek philosophy can be traced right back to Crete itself. As I like to put it, I'll never take credit for things I don't think my race deserves credit for, but it sure is funny how many amazing things happen when we're in the room. Much later, during a drought on the island of Thera, ethnic Cretans would migrate to North Africa, west of Egypt, where they would found the celebrated colony of Cyrenaica. All this taken together, I have come to call Greater Crete. Although, I'm careful to note that we are not talking about an empire here, or thalassocracy as it's been called, rule by the sea. We were never unified on Crete, much less across territory this large. Now, back to the far right. The archaeology of Sicilia shows it often wobbled between central Anatolia and the Middle East when it comes to cultural influence. Eventually, we got the attention of the old Assyrian Empire. In about 2000 BC, we had trade relations with it. They were, their recovered records in Anatolia were the first clues scholars had that they had a very old Indo-European language on their hands. It's probably from them, or somebody like them, that we learned details about the war chariot. We changed the chariot design by moving the wheels under its body, which made it more nimble, and allowed us to put a third man in the chariot with our driver and archer. Probably using that advantage, some of my race moved out of our extended homeland and defeated the Hatti in north-central Anatolia, where they became known as the Hittites and ruled from their capital, Hattusa. As a final observation of this map, I don't think it's a coincidence that one of the first places we Cretans built a colony is near an island named Sicilia. Being the helpful guy on the internet that I am, I've made a few observations about my race and the way we work. First, we have what I call an eminent man culture. We're not the hierarchical top-down type. We tend to gravitate around eminent men, who in turn are in constant contact with other eminent men through complex social networks. I call it eminent man to, dis to distinguish it from the big man culture you used to find in Polynesia, or ancient Israel during the time of judges, right before they got their kings. Big men fill in the gap. They take and defend territory on the fly. Eminent men bear culture. They set precedent. They know that anything they do can have a permanent impact on a growing, evolving civilization, maybe even a big one. So you better get it right. Network specialists would recognize it as a scale-free network, like the map of the internet you see at the left. These networks are robust and extremely stable. We have a long history of sacred communism. Please note the sacred part. We are not secular. And I wouldn't be surprised if most of us still aren't, even in this modern age. But we are semi-communist, and it's worked well for us. We are a slow-burn race. On the next video, where I'll focus on our connection with the Romans, you'll see us slaving away for centuries in central Italy before we finally step out onto the international scene. Want to know why Rome got so big so fast? Well, you start with about 500 years of hard work. We're like human beavers. Try not to snicker. We love big, multi-generational projects. If you want to pick one group of people to colonize Mars with, we should be the first on your list. You see this behavior wherever we go. When we get a chance, that is. Sometimes we're too busy fighting for our lives to build like this. We are martial, excellent fighters, and most importantly, we're the perfect combination of individualistic and collective. We tend to go our own way, but we have no qualms about appointing a dictator who will unify our response to a foreign threat but we're not belligerent. I know that's rich, coming from a guy who says we're the Philistines and built the Roman Empire, but it's actually true. We didn't attack the Greeks when all of Greece was a Stone Age backwater. We tended to settle on territory nobody else wanted. Nobody wanted Crete. It was a big rock in the middle of the Aegean with hard scrabble water resources. Nobody wanted the original sites of Venice and Rome. They were mosquito-infested swamps. They're only great places to live today because we made them great places to live. And we have an outstanding track record dealing with primitive cultures. We got along well with the Stone Age people on Crete and Greece and later in the Apennine Mountains of Central Italy. 
So when I discovered we were the Philistines, I was genuinely confused. Why were we bothering those poor rubes in the hills of Judea? That's when I noticed the violence didn't start until after the Bronze Age collapse of 1250 BC, and then after a violent group known as the Sea People were settled among us by Pharaoh, after they in turn had unsuccessfully attacked Egypt. So when I talk about the Philistines, I carefully distinguish between two different groups, the Minoan Philistines and the Sea People Philistines. Long after the Philistines and the Israelites started fighting each other, I see evidence we Minoans are trying to calm things down. Scholars act confused as to who the Philistines are, so let me break it down for them. We Minoans were in Palestine. The Sea People swooped in from Minoan and Greek and Hittite territory and were settled among us. All these people the Israelites called Philistines. As for Rome, we didn't start building the empire until after our peace had been shattered by the Gauls, who successfully sacked Rome in 390 BC, and after the seemingly unbeatable Carthaginians started filling the Mediterranean with their navy. And then other polities, like some of the Greek city-states, started asking for our help fighting their enemies. Unfortunately, we answered these challenges with a self-sustaining war machine. War is expensive, as you know. You have to pay for these things. And I'm sure you also know, Self-sustaining war machines take on a life of their own. In many ways, the loss of empire was a blessing. Finally, there is an association between us and high religion. If I'm right, you'll see that on the Festus disc. And archaeology has uncovered deep connections between my race and the ancient Israelites, although I seem to have been the only person who noticed this. You ever read Isaac Asimov's Foundation series? There's a foundation, and then, surprise, surprise, it turns out for centuries there was a second foundation working quietly in the background. The Jews are the foundation. We're the second foundation. And just like the second foundation, you were looking right at us all along and didn't even know it. And honestly, I think we're kind of psychic, just like they were. So, we've always seen the Roman Senate as some kind of consciously laid brick on the road to democracy, when in fact it was an expression of our racial soul our eminent man culture at work. And while we have an Anglo-Saxon attitude towards the Roman games and the Roman baths, what we really have is, likewise, an expression of our racial soul. Who else on the planet Earth built large public structures like this that every common man could enjoy, either free of charge or damn cheap? We also kept food prices artificially low. This racial soul is clearly expressed in the so-called palaces of Minoan Crete. Here's the Palace of Festus. The Festus disc was discovered in a caved-in basement at, in Building 101. Archaeologists first called these palaces because they thought we had kings, and therefore these must be where those kings lived. But after more than a hundred years of digging, not a scintilla of evidence has turned out that we've ever had a king. These palaces were for public display and public use. See these courtyards? This is where we had our bull-leaping bull spectaculars and sacred plays. We had huge sacred meals together. The archaeological record is very clear. The courtyards came first. And for a little FYI, a small tablet was also found with the disc. Here's the data from that tablet. I pulled it from the younger site. Our sacred communism goes all the way back to the Stone Age at sites like Cattle Hayuk, where we literally lived together under the same roof. These were the biggest settlements by far on the whole planet Earth for centuries, as I said. What would be a village of two to three hundred people everywhere else would be a little self-contained community just like the one you see here. The larger settlement would be made up of several of these, broken up by roads. These settlements broke up right before we started spinning out into the bigger world. And once again, right as a computer model says, the Indo-European language began splitting up. In the fourth century AD, as the Romans, we officially transferred our capital from Italy to Constantinople, north of Greece and northwest Turkey on the site of a small village called Byzantium. There we continued with our sacred communism. Here's the Hippodrome and the Church of Hagia Sophia, a building so amazing it converted the Russians to Christianity. It was the largest enclosed space on the planet for a thousand years. Note the Sophia. That's coming up later. Incidentally, several thousand of us fled to a swamp in northern Italy when Italy fell to the Huns and the Germans. There, we built a little town called Venice.
Who will we be next? Only God knows where he's taken us. By the way, you know how it's called the Republic of Venice and not the Kingdom of Venice? Racial soul, brothers, racial soul. We had emperors in Rome and Constantinople because we ruled empires. Among ourselves, we can be a lot more informal. I've mentioned that we are the Romans. I would like to amend that. We were part of the people who became the Romans, like the English are part of the people who became the Americans. We made a lot of good friends in our travels across the Mediterranean. We didn't become empire builders just because we were great warriors. Great warriors are a dime a dozen. We're also long-term planners, and most importantly, we are good friends. We've laid our lives down for our friends, and they've laid their lives down for us. I'm not going to push the DNA case too hard here, but I will show you some of the DNA evidence I'll use in my next video. Here's a graph of Y chromosomes from an article written about seven years ago. As you can see, the men in the area surrounding Constantinople, T1, are very close to the men on Crete. That's not true for the men in the city itself, T9, who are much more like the men in Lebanon and far eastern Turkey, T4. That's because Constantinople was largely depopulated by the time it fell in 1453. From a peak of half a million, there were only about 60,000 people there when the Turks took over. The last Byzantine emperor died there, Constantine XI, Palaeologus of blessed memory. The last time anyone saw him, he was still fighting in the streets. The Turks never recovered his body. Here's a map from a much more recent survey dealing with the Y chromosomes of ethnic Iranians, among whom there are quite a few of us, as it turns out. As you can see, both M67s and M92s are well represented in the area around Constantinople, as you would expect if we were the Romans. But over here on the right, we disappear. Why? Because this is the variance distribution, which tracks the varieties of Y chromosomes present. The longer you've been living in a spot, the more variety you've got. So as you can see, we haven't been there very long, biologically speaking. This makes sense since Constantinople wasn't formally inaugurated until 330 AD. Let's compare that to Spain, Portugal really, where we started settling about 500 years before, after the Punic Wars. There's a large population of us there today, and as you can see on the right, there's much more variety than around Constantinople, confirming my suspicion that the migration there was much later, and we are the Romans. Here are my people specifically. We're Southern Italians, right? No, we're Northerners who migrated there. We're Romans. Whenever I read the papers on DNA, I always look through the appendices to find men who have a Y chromosome similar to mine. In one of the papers, I found three. Two are in Benevento, a known Roman colony in southern Italy. Veterans and their families settled in that city in several different waves. In the Second Punic War against Hannibal, Benevento handed him his first early defeats, and when Rome was on the verge of going down, she was among the first cities to fulfill her quota of soldiers and pay her taxes. The third man was in the northern city of Siena in Tuscany. Siena was also a Roman colony founded by Sinius and Ascius, two nephews of Rome's founder, Romulus. And since their father, Remus, was Romulus's twin brother, that means I could be a genetic descendant of Rome's first king. Wouldn't that be awesome? Later, Siena would be settled again under Augustus Caesar. My own line hails from the Carpathian Mountains of northern Hungary, where we were near the bases of no fewer than four Roman legions. The best reflection of the spread of the Roman people out of Rome and into the empire itself is reflected by the larger M67 group. Here they also reflect the extent of the western expansion of what I've already called Greater Crete. And who were these guys? These are the Baloch. As you can see, they're recent immigrants to this region, which is called Baluchistan. Remember me talking about how stable our eminent man culture is? Well, after at least 15 centuries of their neighbors trying to murder them, they've still managed to carve out a nice little place to call their own in southern Pakistan, southern Afghanistan, and southeastern Iran. The Baloch finally settled there definitively about 500 years ago. But until then, they were stretched out over a range of 1,500 miles and still managed to hang on to their ethnic identity. I used to call the Byzantine Romans the junkyard dogs of world history. They lost their fair share of wars and battles, but they always came roaring back. I doff my hat to my brothers in Baluchistan. Here we are as the Philistines. 
As you'd expect, the variation distribution confirms we've been there a long time, probably even before we landed on Crete. Remember, Sicilia intermittently mixed with the Middle East culturally. Here's the variance of the M67s back in the homeland. Just like I said, we're from Sicilia, the Taurus Mountains, and the Konya Plains. Here you can see my line's connection with the Hittites, where we're strongest in the very heart of the old empire. We show hardly any presence in the south, but since we're M67s and obviously from the south, confirmed by the fact that there are so many of us in Crete, that probably reflects what geneticists call the founder effect. We were a small part of the M67s, but obviously a much larger part of the men who had become the Hittites and the Minoans. We still have a fairly decent presence in Turkey, but as you can see, our parent clade hasn't done so well. Many of them migrated to modern Georgia, where we migrated as well, although fairly recently, judging from the variants, the parent clade has been there for quite a while. Here you don't see very many of us in northern Syria, which was at the southern extreme of the old Hittite Empire. That's because all those men are over in Baluchistan. I have no idea who these men are. This is an oasis in the middle of Algeria. Whoever they are, they've been there a good 3,000 years, maybe even longer. I told you we're associated with high religion, right? This is a temple the Balak ancestors built in Ain Dara, just northwest of Aleppo in Syria. The Balak have a tradition that they come from Aleppo, which turns out to actually be true. You ever hear of Uriah the Hittite, one of King David's greatest warriors whom he betrayed? The Balak are probably his people. If this temple looks familiar, that's because David's son, King Solomon, modeled his temple on this one, which in turn is modeled on temples the Hittites had built several centuries earlier. The design even migrated to Greece, where the scholars call it a Megaron. Wherever you find a Mycenaean Greek city, you'll find a Megaron. Solomon's temple had side rooms built around it, and the Hittites living here liked the idea so much they added them to their own. Either that or the Israelites and the Hittites both did it at the same time. Nobody's completely sure. The temple was excavated just recently, in the 1980s. You can still visit it and get a real-life taste of Solomon's temple. I'm pretty sure the prophet Ezekiel visited this site when he was on his way to exile. There was a lot more of it at the time. Aleppo and Ain Dara sit on a major trade route between Jerusalem and Babylon. Ezekiel was from a priestly family, and if you read his book, the imagery was clearly lifted from this temple. No doubt the shock of seeing something so similar to his own annihilated temple, but still largely standing, horrified him and excited him all at the same time. It was even older than his, and bigger. I'd say he translated the imagery of this temple into the visions of his book beautifully. I think that should tell you a lot about what God always thought about us. Here's the Hittite Treaty of Kadesh. Their battle with Egypt over that city was one of the greatest battles in the ancient world. The Egyptians claimed victory, but when the dust settled, the Hittites still held the city. This is the book of Deuteronomy in the Bible. Deuteronomy means second law. It's sort of a digest of Leviticus. But Deuteronomy is actually much more important than that. It is nothing less than the treaty between the Israelites and God, and it is a Hittite treaty. Virtually all the history books that follow it in the Bible are put there to answer one simple question. Are the Israelites keeping the terms of their treaty with God or not? Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. This is called the Deuteronomistic History. I'm going to show you the prophecy of the suffering servant, fulfilled in the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course we're in it, we're the second foundation. When we established Greater Crete, we did it under the secret guidance and protection of God himself. And after his son's resurrection, we went to work building his church. Here is my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen one, with whom I am pleased. Upon him I have put my spirit, and he shall bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out, nor shout, nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow dim or be bruised until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his teaching. Hear me, coastlands. Listen, distant peoples. 
Before birth, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he gave me my name. Be attentive to me, my people. My nation, give ear to me. For teaching shall go forth from me, and my judgment as light to the peoples. I will make my victory come swiftly. My salvation shall go forth, and my arm shall judge the nations. In me the coastlands shall hope, and my arm they shall await. When these prophecies were written, almost all of Israel's troubles came from the north and the east. There were the Syrians and the Assyrians, then the Babylonians, then the Persians. This is where all the trouble was coming from. This is where all the action is. This is where all the greatest civilizations in the world are. But in the middle of all that, God declares, look to the islands, look to the west. It was precisely when these words were written that Rome first started making a name for herself. So despite the efforts of Jews to convince people the prophecies of the suffering servant are really about them, we can clearly see they are about the Lord and his church and us. You want to see something really cool? My people made a name for themselves before they even made it to Crete. They are world famous for the stone figurines they carved as they migrated across the Cyclades. They had a very big impact on the art community of Europe when they first turned up at the beginning of the 20th century. One last thing before I get into the written language of the Minoans, and then the Festus disc itself. Really a question. Is the Minoan language Indo-European? Is it related to the language of the Hittites, and the Iranians, and the Germans, and the Greeks, or not? Most people who, frankly, do this for a living would say it cannot be, because we left Anatolia centuries before the language showed up. I say it has to be, because Anatolia is the homeland of the language, and we were speaking it for more than 2,000 years before we even left for Crete. Most importantly, there is the fact that the Romans are from Crete. The DNA I showed you is just the tip of the iceberg. I also bring in archaeology. And if the Cretans didn't speak some Indo-European language that was a precursor to Latin, I have no idea how so many Cretan descendants throughout the entire Pen Italian peninsula could be speaking some variation of the exact same Indo-European language, especially since they should have been speaking Greek if they were speaking any language other than the language of their ancestors. Now, some believe Italic languages came to Italy from across the Adriatic, from the Balkan Peninsula. Now, why on earth would Cretans be speaking some obscure Balkan language when they could be speaking Greek instead? Here's the map of J2A men in Western Europe, who I use as a proxy in this video for the Minoans and I'll throw in a map of the Italic speakers in Italy. Italic is the family of languages that includes Latin. They're indicated by the grayscale. I'd say that's an outstanding family resemblance, wouldn't you? The area around Rome isn't as obviously Cretan, because as the Roman Empire expanded, Romans moved out into the empire in colonies, and they were replaced with slaves. This is a historically documented fact. Remember me talking about the men in Benevento and Siena who matched my Y chromosome? That's what I'm talking about. Now this leads to the broader question of how the Indo-European language came to be in Anatolia in the first place. Is it native, or did it come in from the outside? Well, let's look. The steppes of Russia are marked up top, where most professional linguists would say it came from. The narrowly marked region is the updated variation of that theme. Down below, exactly in the part of Anatolia where my race is from, you have the alternate homeland adhered to by a minority of trained linguists. In this computer model, which compares all cognates among the different Indo-European languages in the same way it would compare DNA snippets and viruses, you can clearly see that we are the hot zone. All the cognates, not just the words we like, like horse and wheel. In addition, the Indo-European language is a lot older than we thought under this scenario. So it's likely that even the men who migrated to Crete more than 8,000 years ago spoke a very early Indo-European dialect. And that would certainly be true for my people, who migrated about 3,000 years later. Now here's the tree generated by the program. It's fuzzy because it's projecting back into the past using all the cognates and historical data we know now. And there's a lot of probability involved here. The solid lines are where the biggest trend lines run. Here's where my people first show up on Crete. 
Here's the timing on when the Festus disc was printed. Here we have very ancient Greek. This is Avestan, the language of the Zoroastrians. It was extinct long before there was ever a Rome. Here we see Vedic Sanskrit is still a living language. This is the sacred language of the Hindu scriptures. And here I think we are, leading into Latin and the other Italic languages of the Italic family, but probably still sounding a lot like the Iranians. See this? These are the earliest Indo-European languages by far, Hittite, Luwian, and Lycian. The programmers who generated this tree even tied one hand behind our back and cut these old languages out. The conclusion was the exact same. Anatolia is the homeland of Indo-European language. So let's zoom in here a bit, try to answer the question. If the Indo-European languages came to Anatolia from the outside, how did they get there? The most obvious scenario is invasion. And it's true that the Hatti of north central Anatolia were later conquered and ruled by Indo-Europeans. But an invasion from Russia is actively discounted by the archaeology. There are no disruptive, widespread changes in central Anatolia, and there have been huge progress made the last 30 years in Anatolian archaeology. The different regions developed virtually independent of outside influence, with the sole exception of neighboring regions within Anatolia. Furthermore, this alleged invasion is divorced from physical and historical reality. Just look at the map. These alleged invaders from the steppes had to get through all these mountains, and all the people living in these mountains, to get to us. Furthermore, the Aryan invasion of central Anatolia didn't come from the north, it came from the southeast, within spitting distance of our homeland, and more than 4,000 years after we started migrating out of it. What makes the case even worse, the Indo-European languages spoken by our alleged conquerors are thousands of years younger than the Indo-European languages spoken in southern Anatolia. The best point in favor of a steppe origin of the Indo-European Indo language is in the Tarim Basin, where the Tocharian languages are spoken. They are only a few centuries younger than the Anatolian, but nevertheless they are younger, and as I said earlier, even when you handicap us Anatolians by striking out our old languages and leave in these old Tocharian languages, we still come out as the homeland of the language. It gets worse when you look at the DNA. There are three major Y-chromosome groups associated with the Indo-European language. The first is J2A from Anatolia, which we've been talking about all this time. The other is R1B. This is their original homeland right next to us. Today they make up the vast majority of men in Western Europe. And they're the first people in the world to domesticate cattle, and they taught us how to do that. And we've mixed with them for thousands of years. Some even migrated with us to Crete. So, if you were to tell me these are the original Indo-European Aryans, I'd accept that. But nobody believes that. The last are the R1As, way up here in the Russian steppes, right in the heart of Kurgan territory. And while we're here, please note the direction of immigration. Both us and the R1B streamed out of Anatolia. And until the aforementioned old Assyrian Empire came in from the Middle East, a Semitic Empire that doesn't have anything to do with this, nobody was streaming in. I'm dead certain this reflects the expansion of the Indo-European language. It's the only thing that makes sense. The second scenario is cultural contact, but once again there's no evidence of that. And in the event, if there were any cultural contact, it wouldn't look like this. It would look like this. We were much more advanced than they were. You're not going to get any help from looking over at Greece, either. Scholars have talked for decades about the coming of the Greeks, probably about 1700 BC. But just as in Anatolia, there's been an explosion of archaeological discoveries in Greece the last 30 years. No evidence of such an invasion. In fact, this is right in the middle of a thousand-year phase of relative stability in Greece. And at the time, the only foreigners we see there are us Anatolians. So I call this age, which stretched from roughly 2200 to 1250 BC, the age of architecture, beautiful pottery, and really pretty clothes. Although we are great warriors, the real secret of our success is our love of beauty and high culture. The two main streams of Anatolian influence come from Anatolia itself, to an island just a bit south of Athens, where they built the first colony, the, the first city in Greece, Kelowna. It was there that Anatolians built the first Megaron. I say they because by this time we'd long since immigrated to Crete. But we had a big impact on the Greeks, too. Our Camaras pottery is well represented in the archaeological record. Now, as you can see, Crete is not included in this map. That's because it hasn't been determined whether or not we actually spoke an Indo-European language. Here's a map of Kelowna. Here's some of our pottery. 
Finally, a scholar weighs in on the possibility of large-scale immigration into Anatolia. Mind you, when I read this, understand this specialist does not believe the Indo-European language came from Anatolia. On balance, there is no convincing archaeological evidence at present for the migration of Indo-European speaking groups into Asia Minor. A second issue is whether large-scale migration is the most plausible mechanism for the dispersal of Indo-European languages into Asia Minor. Here it is of interest that historically documented migration periods have often not impacted the linguistic landscapes. Neither in Lombardy, Lombards, nor in Andalusia, Vandals, is Germanic spoken today. By contrast, in the examples of Arabic, Latin, and Turkish already mentioned, it was political hegemony by a small elite that resulted in language shift. To my mind, the latter is a more likely model for the uptake of Indo-European into Asia Minor, and it is one that would be more difficult to substantiate on the basis of archaeological data. While these particular examples occurred in imperial contexts, similar mechanisms have been noted for language shifts in pre-state contexts, such as the rise of the Luo language in East Africa. Thus, language spreads do not necessarily need to be conceived of as migration waves accompanied by war and destruction. The Romans, Arabs, and Turks ruled empires. Armies and culture and ideology spread their language. That was impossible in Anatolia during the time period here. And I don't know why Dr. During thinks this would not show up in the archaeological record. These guys certainly do. But he's right when he brings up the Luo. It proves people can spread a language relatively peacefully through high religion and savvy resource management. And as you will see, that obviously applies to the spread of the Indo-European language. But barbarians from the Russian steppes didn't do that. We were literate 3,000 years before they were. And we turned swamps and deserts into high civilization, so you tell me who was savvy with resource management.